Hello friends, my name is Yuri Kovalenok and I make physics and engineering notes. I think these disciplines are inseparably linked to each other. I would like to establish this connection in the notes that you are now seeing and which you can push chase from the link that I will leave in the description of this video. By doing this you support me and the creation of notes too. And I have prepared some analysis of the topics that are covered in my notes. I hope that you will watch all the videos at once, but you can view my points of view on a particular topic as it is relevant to you. Thank you for being with me and I'll move on to analyzing the topics in my notes. So, steam turbine, uh, type of heat engine, a gasoline engine, diesel engine, steam turbine or steel link engine is a type of steam engine. In general, the steam engine is represented by a structural diagram in which there is a heater and a refrigerator. Generally speaking, in order for the gas to work on external forces, it needs to be heated. In this case, the gas will push the piston in the cylinder. More precisely, the axis pressure multiplied by the R will create an extra force that will push the piston and uh, do the work. The more heat and energy we bring to the working fluid, that is the to the gas, the further the piston will move. But will such a system be a heat engine? Answer no. This is an engine but uh, not thermal one. The heat engine must perform a certain cycle, that is, the piston must be returned to its starting position. Therefore, in order to return the piston in, to its place, it is necessary to take away a certain amount of heat. They say that you need to give the amount of heat to the refrigerator. The difference in the amount of heat will give uh, us useful work. Naturally, if the amount of heat from the heater is equal to the amount of heat received uh, by the refrigerator, then the work will be zero. Sometimes students have to the erroneous opinion that uh, in order to return the piston back, you need to give as much heat to the refrigerator as was received from the heater. This is not true. In this case, uh, no useful work will be done. Naturally, the ratio of of, uh, the useful work to the heat of the heater will give us the efficiency of the heat engine. It should always be less than one or less than 100% if you express the efficiency as a percentage. A little bit from a stem turbine. If we are talking about a stem turbine, then we need to take into account the fact that steam is a gas. Uh, if the water under normal condition cannot be heated above 100 degrees Celsius, then the stem can be heated at least indefinitely. Uh, usually, the stem is heated before entering the turbine to from 300 to 500 degrees. This means the pressure of such steam is very large and uh, it is uh, able to spin the turbine to high speeds or connect the turbine shaft to the generator shaft and we get a thermal power plant. So the next post is the transmission. What is the main purpose of the gearbox? The gearbox does not give any gain. If we win in speed, we lose in acceleration. Gearbox is needed for internal combustion engines. The fact is that the power of the internal combustion engines depends on the rotation speed of the shaft on which the piston are located. Useful torque is only possible at certain engine speeds. Therefore, it is not profitable to connect the internal combustion engine directly to the wheels and uh, device scaled uh, gearbox is required. Transmission are mechanical, automatic, robotic and variator. All types of gearbox are complex but uh, it is important to understand that there are certain gears that give a gain in power but at the same time a loss in speed. I love the manual transmission most of all and I can't imagine driving with an automatic trans transmission on a slippery road. 
I think it's very difficult. Moreover, with uh, manual transmission, you can start the engine with a uh, very low battery charge. Of course, you will have to ask someone to push your car, squeeze the clutch, turn in second gear, and abruptly uh, release. I've always used it before, which an automatic transmission, everything is much more complicated. If you have different opinion, then write about it in the comments. So friends, the next note is the rear axle differential, more precisely the center differential of the rear axle. This is a clever device that allows the wheels to rotate at different speeds on curved section of the truck. It may seem quite unusual how can the wheels rotate at different speeds from the sum shaft. This is will require a device inside the rear axle that allows you to transfer different power to the wheels and is called on interaxle differential. This ingenious device consists of three main components, a driving gear, a driven gear and a satellite. The driven pinion is connected to pinion by a satellite, thanks to which different power transmission is carried out on the curved track blades. The satellite can perform two types of rotation, together with the driving gear and around its own axis. The satellite is also connected by a gear train with two semi-axial gears. This complex design allows you to transfer the torque from the shaft to the wheels. If the wheels are moving straight, the satellite transmits approximately the same power to the two wheels. Another thing is if the car turns and in this case the rotation of the satellite is carried out so that one wheel gets more power and the other less. This circumstance causes some inconvenience if one wheel stands for example on the road with good friction and the other on the ice. In this case it will be very difficult to move from the place. You will need to upgrade the design of the satellite which increased internal resistance. In this case I will have to draw a lot and uh, this is quite difficult for me. So friends, I move on the next note. Gas turbine engine. This is an air engine in which the air is compressed by a supercharger before burning fuel in it. And the supercharger is driven by a gas turbine that uses the energy of the gases heated in this way. In the simplest version, a gas turbine engine consists of a compressor and a turbine which are located on the same shaft. The fuel is burned in the combustion chamber which is located between the compressor and the turbine. The exhaust gas is rotating the turbine drive the compressor to compress the air. In fact there are huge number of uh, varieties of gas turbine engines. It reminds me of a blue torch with two fans. By the way it will be necessary to try to make a gas turbine engine based on a blow torch. I'll do it when I have time. If you do it yourself, be careful. My intention was drawn to a car which uh, such an engine. As far as I know, cars which this type of engine reproduced during the period from 1963 to 1964 in the United States of America, but due to the high fuel consumption and the large amount of nitrogen oxide in the treated gases. These cars were withdrawn from production. If you know something more about this, then write in the comments. Yes, of course, electric cars do not produce harmful gas, but where do you get energy to charge electric cars? Then where to put the spent batteries? These will also pollute the environment. A gas turbine engine can consume not only gasoline or kerosene, but also organic fuels such as rapeseed oil. The Chrysler cars used uh, transmission. What if the gearbox is replaced with a generator and an electric motor? In this case it seems to me the car could be very maneuverable and serve as an alternative charging device for electric vehicles that could not get to the charging station. I think this car is prematurely withdrawn from mass production. The best option is this type of engine will be used in hybrid cars. It's quite interesting. 
think about it. So friends, the next note about the electric car. Yes, I love Tesla too. You need a battery with a large number of ampere hours. You need a converter that converts direct current to free fast alternating current. And you need the asynchronous motor with a short circuit rotor. In batteries, the difference in the rates of a chemical reaction creates an EMF. Each battery creates a small number of volts, so the batteries are equipped with batteries that create the necessary DC operating volt. Direct current from batteries is converted to three fast alternating current, which can vary in frequency and amplitude. This leads to the necessary rotation of the asynchronous motor with a closed loop rotor. On the other hand, the same asynchronous motor is able to charge the battery in the recovery mode. The asynchronous motor is very simple and reliable, which consists of a three-phase winding eye range and an angle of 120 degrees to each other. When a three-phase alternating voltage is applied, a rotating magnetic field is formed in the winding which crosses the rotor. The rotor, in simple terms, is a piece of metal in which eddy currents are created according to the law of electromagnetic induction. These eddy currents cause the rotor to move according to the lens rule. The speed of rotation of the rotor is always slightly lower than the speed of rotation of the rotating magnetic field in this case. The car wash moves either with acceleration or at a constant speed. If the frequency of rotation of the rotor is greater than the frequency of the rotating magnetic field, the electric motor is able to operate in the generator mode and charge the battery through the uh, inverter. In this case, the braking energy charges the battery, which is very practical, I think. In order for an electric car to have a large power reserve, uh, you need a lot of batteries, so an electric car has a large mass, since the battery compartment can be half the mass of the car. You need specially equipped charging station that create a large car and strength, which is able to charge the battery in a relatively short time. Electric car, well, the question of the disposal of batteries and the energy of charging the car remains open. I stick to hybrid electric cars. I move on to the next note. Perpetual motion and perpetual thin. Is perpetual motion possible or impossible? What do you think about this right? You answer me in the comments. As I committed physicist, I believe in the impossibility of creating such a machine. We need to make some clarity in the definition of the perpetual motion machine. A perpetual motion machine is a machine that does not consume anything, does work or use less energy but produces more. This is all a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. There is also a perpetual motion machine of the second kind when the efficiency of the engine is 100%. On the internet there are many varieties of supposedly working perpetual motion machines. Watch the videos about free energy when the light bulb leads near the magnetic and lead up or the motor turns the generator which feeds this motor. Another interesting question is the engine on the water. Yes, of course, but this will require the confusing water into oxygen and, and hydrogen and this will require a lot of energy. Therefore, I consider these projects fake. In physics, there are theorems about the impossibility of creating a perpetual motion machine and yet a hydroelectric power power plant or a tidal wave power plant is not a perpetual motion machine. This is a kind of solar energy. I hope you understand who the water flows in the river and where the clothes come from. It's all from the energy of the sun. Our task is 
to make the engine efficiency as high as possible. This is the main task. Gasoline engine have an efficiency of 20-25% and uh, diesel engine has efficiency of 27-33%. Electric motors can have significantly higher efficiency. The highest efficiency is possible in a transformer up to 98% that converts alternating current but not current power. This is a very interesting friends. Do not try to make a perpetual motion machine and do not create free energy generators. I believe that this is impossible but I like to experiment with a Tesla transformer the efficiency of which is several percent. So I move on to the next note, it's a carburetor. I believe that the carburetor in modern cars is no longer used. It was replaced by an injector. But when I was young I had a car with a carburetor and it always smelled like gasoline. The carburetor is necessary in order to get the fuel mixture um, in the gasoline engine. I hope you understand that in the absence of air gasoline does not burn and only gasoline will enter the cylinder. Then and this will come to the spark plug way and the engine will not start. Therefore you need to create a combustible mixture of gasoline and air. This is exactly what the carburetor serves for. When the piston is lowered from the upper extreme position to the lower extreme position, a region of reduced pressure is created which sucks in air. The higher the air velocity, the lower the pressure compared to atmospheric pressure. This leads to the fact that the atmospheric pressure pushes gasoline through a small hole and polarization occurs. The air becomes enriched with gasoline vapors. The mixture, which is called a working mixture, is uh, higher flammable. The design of the carburetor is quite simple and interesting. There is a flow chamber that dispenses fuel together with a throttle valve that regulates the air supply. The carburetor is simple and reliable in operation. Modern carburetors are filled with pumps and electronics that improve the fuel dosage but much better fuel dosing is carried out by engine equipped with an injector. But this is not the next note. So we move on to the next notes about injectors. I mentioned early carburetors were replaced by injection engines or engines with electronic fuel injection. What is the advantage of a more accurate calculation of the fuel supply in relation to the amount of air mixture and as a result a good fuel automatization through the injectors. When the piston reaches the position of the upper deed center which compresses air at this point, the liquid fuel under high pressure is injected into the cylinder and sprayed using the nozzle and leads to the best combustion. The result is a higher engine efficiency. The car also does not smell of gasoline. However, the injectors also has disadvantages. This is electronics. This server called in injection engine cannot be started at all. The carburetor engine can be started in any weather. Electronic sensor periodically require replacement. They constantly need to be changed. Repair of injection engines is more expensive than for example carburetor engines. But the environmental standards in injection engines are much higher than in carburetor engine. That is in injector engine pollute the environment less than carburetor engines. As a result environmental standards have pushed carburetor engine into the background. I guess carburetor cars have become antique. There are many different types of injection engines. For example, engines with direct fuel injection or which distributed fuel injection and so on. For the operation of the injection engine, the following components are required. 
an electronic control unit, a high pressure gas pump, a fuel pressure sensor, a fuel ramp, electronic injector and intake manifold which are throttle valve as well as sensor for the temperature of the colon detonation, airflow throttle position, crankshaft position and the presence of oxygen in the exhaust manifold. All the sensors fire sooner or later and the injectors are coked, especially if you start using low quality fuel. They can be cleaned, but this will require some cost. That's all for now and I'll move on to the next mode. I have moved away from mechanics a little and I am moving on to physics. This is a Tesla coil. The Tesla company has patented the name Tesla for its cars, but the Tesla coil is quite different. So the next note is a Tesla coil. If you are an agent in amateur radio, then sooner or later you will want to make a Tesla coil. However, this is not easy. Fortunately, I have made many Tesla coils and would like to tell you something about it. A Tesla coil is a resonant transformer with inductive feedback. We are talking about the fact that you need accurately calculate at what frequency your resonant transformer will work. At most important, this resonant frequency should be equal to the natural frequency of the secondary winding of the transformer. The frequency of the primary winding of the transformer must be equal to the frequency of the secondary winding of the transformer, which is the resonant frequency for the secondary coil. Naturally, the question arises how to find the natural of resonant frequency of the secondary winding of the transformer. To do this, I just made this note. The resonant frequency is determined by the Thomson formula. You can easily find the inductance of the coil, but it is quite another thing to find the electrical capacitance of the coil. The electrical capacitance of a coil is a parasitic or parasitic electrical capacitance, the value of which is very small. There are many theories, but there is no single theory on how to find the parasitic electrical capacitance of the secondary winding of a Tesla transformer. I found the formula, it uh, is like this, but there is no other one. At uh, least I used it uh, and my coils work. You can see a lot of my experiments with Tesla coils. This is original and I think it is interesting. So if you want to make a Tesla coil, you will need a thin Cooper wire with diameter of 0.5 one five millimeter to zero point five millimeter you must wind to no more than one thousand turns you need to wind it in one layer very carefully cover it with varnish or epoxy resin hope to wind tesla coil on my channel there is a fragment of how i did this with my students if you have any questions about this write about it in the comments when you set up the electrical circuit for better resonance in the primary coil you will need to make tabs for finding resonance in the current however you cannot solder the tabs from the turns of the primary coils it all depends on which circuit you will use you have main tesla coils and radio tubes on bipolar transistor on field effect transistor on an insulated gate bipolar transistor the later option being the most difficult but the most reliable the tesla coil on bipolar transistor which isolated gate still works and that a good thing so the most important thing is uh, to clarify adjust the operating frequency of the primary coil of the transformer in resonance with the natural frequency of the secondary coil of the transformator typically the coil frequencies can range from 200 kilohertz to 500 kilohertz when assembling the circuit do not allow long wires in the part of the circuit that is responsible of the oscillation circuit if you want to make the simplest version of the tesla coil then start with the Brovin catcher on a field effect transistor or which tesla tube coils if you have radio tubes it's uh, easy to make a tesla transformer on a radio tube so if this topic is relevant to you then write about it in the comments and i will move on to the next note
So my friends, we are moving on. The next node is also a turbine or turbocharger. I can't even name it right. What is it? A turbine, turbocharger or compressor? I like turbocharged cars. The exhaust energy spins the turbine which is located on the same shaft as the compressor which compresses the air before it enters the combustion chamber. More air, hence more oxygen and hence the combustion is better and higher efficiency. Turbocharging is part on both diesel engines and gasoline engines. However, diesel engines are put more often. This is due to the fact that the exhaust gas temperature due to uh, adiabatic expansion is lower than that of a gasoline engine. Therefore, very heat resistant materials are not required for the manufacture of a diesel turbine, such as for the manufacture of a gasoline turbine. In diesel engines, the turbine is more efficient than in gasoline engines. Do you have the turbocharged petrol engine? It seems to me that when the turbine is turned on, the car has a sharp acceleration. For the efficiency of the, the turbine, the air after the turbine needs to be cooled. I think that if you put a tank with liquid nitrogen, how much do you think the engine power will increase? Unfortunately, there is no way to check it yet, but I am thinking about it. This is most likely appropriate for a drug race, but take precaution if you experiment with it. Nevertheless, the turbine works effectively with an intercooler, which lowers the temperature of the compressed air. Another interesting feature is, is nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide strongly cools the hot air in the cylinder and when heated it breaks down into nitrogen and oxygen. The presence of nitrogen in the combustion chamber prevents the detonation of the fuel. This is very interesting, I think. What do you know about nitrous oxide? Write your answer in the comments and I'll move on the next note. So this time a little bit about internal combustion engines, more precisely about gasoline internal combustion engines. The thermodynamics cycle of a gasoline engine is called the auto cycle, which in PV coordinates has the form that you are currently seeing. In the pressure and volume coordinates you can also see what processes the auto cycle consists of. Since the isothermal process is very similar to the adiabatic process, I remind you that process 1, 2 is the adiabatic compression of the working fluid and process 3, 4 is the adiabatic expansion of the working fluid. The auto cycle can also be described in terms of temperature and entropy. You know what entropy is. This is a very complex concept that characterizes uh, a measure of randomness or randomness. I will limit myself to drawing a note for the exam that will help you understand the auto cycle. That's all for now and I'll move on to the next note. Next note, speedometer. Do you know how the speedometer works? At least I know how the speedometer works in old cars. About modern cars I am afraid I don't know. But in older cars the speedometer is based on the force action of eddy currents on a metal disc. When the magnetic rotates near the metal disc, the disc also begins to rotate. Since the metal disc is connected to a spring or spiral which does not allow the disc to rotate, but only deflects it from the rear position touched creating a counter torque. The faster the speed of the car, the faster the magnet rotates and the more the arrow is deflected which indicates the speed of movement. The mechanism of eddy currents is related to the concept of a rotating magnetic field. According to this principle, Tesla electric motors also works in cars. And this is the next note. 
So the next note is a little bit about the Tesla car, more precisely about an electric motor which is called a three-phase asynchronous motor which a short circuit rotor. These are the engines found in Elon Musk's Tesla car. I have already said a little about this early, but I would like to once again pay attention to this very invention of humanity. So I, if we have a three-phase alternating current which can be obtained from direct current using an inverter then the three phase alternating current creates a rotating magnetic field in the asynchronous motor in an asynchronous motor the reading of the electromagnet are located at an angle of 120 degrees to each other when a three phase alternating current enters the space where the rotor is located a rotating magnetic field occurs this field is similar to a permanent magnet which rotates so that the magnetic field lines of force cut off the metal rotor. In the metal rotor eddy currents are induced within the framework of the law of electromagnetic induction and according to the Lenz rule. They themselves begin to interact with the rotating magnetic field, thus the rotor begins to rotate in the direction of the vortex magnetic field but never reaches the rotation frequency of the field itself, which is who it is called an asynchronous motor. Since the rotation frequency of such a motor is always less than the rotation frequency of the field. This is a very useful invention that you can send great into Elon Musk, although it is unclear to the he will watch this and we move on to the next note. So the following in the mass defect, this is already from nuclear physics. A very interesting phenomenon is when the mass of individual nucleons is greater than the mass of the nucleus itself. From this we must conclude that energetically favorable reaction occur only when light nuclei merge, for example deuterium and tritium. However, this is only possible at very high temperature. Scientists are faced with the task of merging deuterium and tritium for exclusively peaceful purposes and uh, implementing a controlled thermonuclear reaction. So far, we haven't been able to do that. So I will return it. I say that from the point of view of the mass effect, the fusion of light nuclei is energetically advantageous, but if we consider the bending energy per nucleon, then the fusion reaction in heavy nuclei, for example, the fusion of uranium nuclei are also energetically advantageous. Thus, there are two types of nucleus reaction, fusion of heavy nuclei and fusion of light nuclei. On the basis of phenomenon Einstein derived the formula for the relationship for the relationship between mass and energy which I am now showing you. Energy and mass are common matter. A very interesting, isn't it? I think this is a phenomenon that deserves attention. Energy and mass to the speed of light in the second degree, and in general, the nucleus forces are much stronger than the electric forces of the Coulomb interaction. However, the nuclear forces act only at very small distance and mainly to interact with neighboring nucleons. That's all for now and I'll move on to the next note. A little bit of molecular physics. In this note we are talking about the derivation of the basic equation of molecular kinetic theory. Of course we are talking about the ideal gas. If you remember kinematics then the solution to the main problem of mechanics was to find the coordinates of the body. To solve the main problem of molecular kinetic theory it is necessary to determine the pressure of an ideal gas on the vessel wall. I hope you know what uh, an ideal gas is. If you don't know, uh, then an ideal gas is a mathematical abstraction. Instead of molecules, we take material points that do not interact with each other. That is, material points experience absolutely elastic collisions. This will allow us to determine the change in the momentum of our material points in this case of an absolute elastic impact. As you can see, the change in momentum is equal to twice the momentum. 
after that we determine the pressure of the particle flow after the flow pressure we determine the pressure of the ideal gas however we need to take into account the fact that in state of speed we take a certain average value of speed which is defined like this and is called the root mean square velocity of the molecules after that we need to take into account two more circumstances the first is that only half of the molecules from the total concentration of molecules will move in the direction the first is that only half of the molecules from the total concentration of molecules will move in the direction of the phase for which we determine the pressure and we have to take only a fifth of the remaining amount because the material points has three degree of freedom therefore equal probability oscillation are talking only in the direction we need and therefore we take only of thrift of the total number of molecules if you combine everything as I say you can independently derive the basic equation of molecular killing theory and we will move on to the next note and I can't help but not to the law of electromagnetic induction. This is the most basic thing in physics and engineering as well. Without this law I could not imagine the life of a modern person. That is the basic law of the basic of which an electric current is generated. It was opened by Faraday. That was a long time ago and this law was discovered quite by accident. Faraday did not even imagine how widespread this phenomenon will become in science and technology. So I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the essence of the of this law is still not clear. We accept this uh, is a fact and cannot answer who this is happening. Have you ever wondered who an alternating magnetic field creates a current in a conducting circuit? Is it an alternating magnetic field? This is a very interesting circumstance. An alternating magnetic field creates a variable magnetic flux. Uh, if the flow changes, an electric current will be generated in the conductive circuit. In turn, the electric current itself creates a magnetic field. If the current is constant, then the magnetic field is constant. And if the current changes, then I will probably move on to the next node phenomenon of self-induction. This phenomenon is a consequence of the law of electromagnetic induction which I just told you about. It is of great importance in engineering and allow us to answer the questions how to get 500 volts from 5 volts. Have you ever touched about it? When I was a child I was playing with an old transformer and I connected it to a battery with a voltage of several volts and I was hit several times with an electric current. I could not understand who this happened. Later, when I entered the institute, I understood who this happened. We are talking about self-induction when the energy of the magnetic field is released in the form of an EMF of self-induction, which can be significantly greater than the voltage in the current serve. This is the case when you count on one voltage and you get many times more voltage, which can be life threatening. For this reason, you cannot turn off the room with electric motors, only one switch is quite dangerous. When the case is closed, the voltage gradually increases. When the case is opened, the energy of the magnetic fields is released very sharply. And I am moving on to the next node. So I move on to the next node. This is a diesel engine. I hope you know that the engine ignites the mixture on a hot air which is obtained from a short compression. The operation of a diesel engine is associated with such a concept as the adiabatic process. An adiabatic process is a process that occurs in an isolated system from the environment. That is, there is no heat exchange with the environment. But what about the engine, in which there is a heat exchange with the cylinder walls? In this case, the adiabatic process is achieved exclusively by very fast compression. With very fast compression, the air does not have time to cool down. 
when the piston approaches the upper D center, sprite fuel in is injected and ignition occurs. This is the basis for the operation of a diesel engine which is more economical than for example a gasoline engine. I should note that the diesel engine requires a more precisely fit and good compression. This legend are conveniently equipped with turbocharging. Since the exhaust gas temperature is lower than the exhaust gas temperature of a gasoline engine, the efficiency of a diesel engine can reach 40% now a little bit above the adiabatic process. As I say early, the adiabatic process takes place in an isolated system from the environment. If you apply the first principle of thermodynamics to the adiabatic process, you get that the system does work by reducing its internal energy. And if external forces perform the work of compressing on the gaze, then the internal energy of the of gaze increases and consequently the temperature increases. However, you can do something else if the ideal gaze. If the molecules of an ideal gas are considered as material points, then when the gas is compressed, the molecules will be replayed, um, will be repelled at a higher rate, thereby the average square energy of the material points or ideal gas will increase. This will cause the gas to heat up. I'm moving on to the next note. So I move on to the next note. This is photo effect. I believe that this is the future. This is a phenomenon from a quantum physics based on this phenomenon all solar panels work. We are talking about the fact that under the influence of light you can tear electrons from the surface of the metal. This is the so-called external photo effect. I should note the fact that solar panels works on the basis of an internal photo effect. Do you know the difference between an external photo effect and an internal photo effect? Write about it in the comments. So, I like this phenomenon which proves the dual nature of light. As you probably know, on the one hand light is an electromagnetic wave and on the other hand light is a stream of particles called photons which do not have mass. They do not exist at rest. It's very interesting, isn't it? This dual nature of light is called wave-particle dualism. We don't really know what it is. We simply cover our ignorance with the word wave-particle dualism. However, back to the solar panels. Let's talk about how photo EMF occurs. Photo EMF can occur at the metal semiconductor interface or at the interface of semiconductor with different types of electrical conductivity. As you understand, the conduction band is separated from the valence band. The zone is called the band gap, the width of uh, the width of which is not large compared to the electrics. Under the influence of light, electrons hold pairs are formed. Under the influence of the concentration gradient, a similar accumulation of electrons in the N region occurs and holes in the pair region, which in turn leads uh, to the appearance of an electromotive force. This is due to the fact that some charge carriers oversome the potential barrier while others do not. If for example the pair region is illuminated with light then when electrons hold pairs are formed, the electrons can cross the band gap and get uh, into the N region, thereby increasing the concentration of electrons in the N region and holes in the pair region. Let's move on to the next note. So my friends, if you are not trying to listen in to me, I would like to draw your attention to such a question as the creating of controlled thermonuclear fusion. More precise energy efficient controlled thermonuclear fusion. Today thermonuclear fusion has been carried out only with the explosion of a hydrogen bomb and we are talking about the peaceful use of thermonuclear energy and the fusion of light nuclei. For example, deuterium and tritium. A little theory, deuterium and tritium are isotopes of hydrogen. Under normal conditions they 
the nuclei cannot interact since they have a positive charge and the electric repulsive force uh, manifested uh, at much greater distance than the forces of nuclear attraction between the nucleons. The question arises as to how to force the nuclei of deuterium and tritium closer to such a distance than that between them there is already a nuclear interaction. The answer is that you need a high kinetic energy of the motion of the nuclei. This uh, is achieved by using a very high temperature, millions of degrees Celsius. I hope you know the temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particle motion. Unfortunately, this high temperature is reached when an atomic bomb explodes. The question of how I hope to use thermonuclear energy for peaceful purposes. There are two methods. The first method using microwaves you need to head the plasma from nuclei of deuterium and tritium to very high temperature in a special toroidal chamber in which the plasma will be held by a magnetic field. The second method is to heat the plasma with laser beams. In a special device we can call it a reactor, a target consisting of deuterium and tritium is placed. This target is sharply heated by powerful lasers and a small explosion occurs which releases heat which uh, for example you can get steam and so on. When heated in the framework of the law of conservation of momentum, a sharp compression as occurs. This is due to the law of conservation of momentum when the shell of the target sharply damaged and the contents of the target is sharply compressed. We get an adiabatic process which further increases the temperature and of the contents in the target. We are talking about the terium and tritium. As a result, we will get controlled thermonuclear fusion. This one of the option for obtaining laser controlled thermonuclear fusion. However, I repeat once again, so Fred, the energy costs uh, are higher than the energy yield of a thermonuclear reaction. For now, we need to think more about this topic. What do you think about this? You write your answer in the comments. And I'll move to on the next note. So the next note is a quantum computer. I could not avoid the subject. Do you know what a quantum computer is? The answer is of course not. The answer to the question you need to know what quantum physics is. No one knows what quantum physics is since quantum physics does not obey the concepts of classic physics. Therefore it is very difficult to understand how a quantum computer works and yet I made a note on this topic. Let's start with the classic representation of a simple computer. As you understand, a simple computer understands the, the language of two digits 0 and 1. A, a computer doesn't have a brain, just a program. The piece of hardware I'm currently working on understands only two digits 0 low level, 1 high level or zero no, one yes. All your smartphones, Androids, iPads and other electronic devices also work. The machine has no brain. A quantum computer doesn't have a brain either. However, between zero and one, a quantum system can occupy an infinite number of states. Hope it is possible that there are an infinite number of states between zero and one. Classical physics confuse us, which is not the case with quantum physics. The work of quantum physics is based on two principles, quantum entanglement and quantum superposition, which are explained using a mathematical abstraction in the form of block sphere. These are very complex concepts and if you are interested in this topic then write about it in the comments. Maybe I will make notes about quantum superposition or quantum entanglement. As for the quantum computer that's all for now. But I'll move on to the next note. The next note Maxwell equations. Do you know that in their stroke equations they are absolutely all electricity? Phenomenal isn't it? 
describe all electrical phenomena in four equations. So the first equation relates, relates uh, the section called electrostatic. This is the Gauss theorem in differential form. On the right side of the equation is uh, not the density of matter, but the bulk density of free electric charge. Maxwell's second equation also in different form states that there are no magnetic charge. The magnetic field lines of force are closed by vortex lines. There are no magnetic charge. Maxwell's third equation is Faraday law or the law of electromagnetic induction. The minus seen in this equation is the Lenz rule. A variable magnetic field creates a vortex electric field. Note that in Maxwell field equation the electric field has already become a vortex. In the first Maxwell equation the electric field is not a vortex and in the third Maxwell equation an electric field becomes a vortex. This is a very important fact. Well, the fourth Maxwell equation this is the bio savarl plus law. But one more term must be taken into account, which is called uh, displacement currents. The force Maxwell equation say that the magnetic field is created not only by conduction currents, but also by a time-varying electric field. That's all. This is a ready-made answer in my Institute for the Electricity exam. Well, I'll move on to the next note. So perhaps I'll finish with the space theme. This is a note on cosmic velocities. I respect Elon Musk. In general, a little bit about cosmic speed. Very interesting concepts. It's about how far we want to go if we start from a particular planet. The easiest way to do this is for Earth. You can't independently calculate the cosmic velocity for Mars. So the first cosmic velocity Imagine that the Earth has no atmosphere. If there is no atmosphere, then there is no air resistance. So if you throw a stone without a resistance, then the horizontal component of the velocity will be a constant value. But the stone will still fall to the ground due to the gravitational pull. But if you throw a stone at a very high speed, for example, at speed of 8 km per second, the stone will not fall to the ground, but will rotate around the Earth and became an artificial satellite of the planet. Of course, this is an idealized version, since in the presence of one of an atmosphere at this speed, the stone is more likely to burn from friction, which they are. Another thing is to go beyond the thick layer of the atmosphere. In this case, the atmospheric layers do not prevent the development of such of high speed. Moreover, in orbit, the first cosmic speed is less than the first cosmic speed at the Earth's surface. As for the second cosmic speed, the speed gives us the opportunity to go beyond the gravity of Earth and move in parabolic orbit. We throw the stone in horizontal direction and it moves farther and farther away from the Earth. This is the second cosmic velocity and finally the third cosmic velocity when launched from the surface of the phage, the body can go beyond the attraction of the solar system. And the four cosmic speed makes it possible to go beyond our galaxy. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? On this my friends, I am done for now. So my friends, I've finished. I hope I've opened something up of you. I hope you have realized that in physics and engineering, the more you know quantitatively, the less you know as a percentage. A beautiful paradox, isn't it? These scientists are complex and if you understand this, then you are an expert. If you think that everything in physics is easy and simple, then you are superficial about science. You can also find me on social media. On Instagram or Facebook, this is my new page. The old page had to be blocked because it was stolen by scammers. And I am still on YouTube. I will leave the links in the description of this video. I also opened a group on Telegram, Physics and Art, where you are also invited. That's all for now. Thank you for your attention. I say goodbye to you until the next projects and offer to update the world rock with new clothes of people of science. Sincerely, Yuri Kovalenok.